Thomas Page McBee embodies the intersection of identity and creativity. He's a trans man, first trans man to box at Madison Square Garden, but he's also an incredibly thoughtful chronicler of what it means to be a man. So I am thrilled to be here with you, Thomas Page McBee. Um, you are a man extraordinaire. You're a journalist, author. You have been central to the reboot of two queer iconic TV shows, Tales of the City and The L Word, mm -hmm. which is about the queerest thing anyone could do. <laughs> um, and of course, you've written uh, two best-selling books, Man Alive in 2014 and Amateur which I read uh, in 2018 when it came out, and it blew my mind. Um, perhaps we can start with you just telling us what Amateur is about. I began thinking about masculinity when I transitioned, which was in 2011. I felt like I was having a masculinity crisis kind of every day, just trying to navigate the world. So many things didn't make sense to me anymore. I knew that I would experience a lot of privilege, for example, but I didn't really understand like the, the many subtle, nuanced ways that occurred, like being at work. You know, opening my mouth and speaking during a meeting and having the whole room get quiet like had never happened to me before. Um, but there were also ways that as I was sort of like literally walking down the street, I realized that my body was a threat a lot of the time. So like if I was sharing a, a street at night with a woman and I was walking up behind her, I realized that, that she would be scared, you know, and sort of walk faster to get away from me. Um, and so being sensitive to that was obviously important, but I also got to thinking a lot about like, how has it become this way that being a man means all of these things? And I myself had experienced violence at the hands of men. Um, my, my stepfather abused me growing up. I was mugged at gunpoint in a really terrifying way. Once I transitioned, you know, often the story ends there for people. And I thought, you know, I have an opportunity. This is a really unique experience for me as a human being. I decided, you know, there's something going on with masculinity and violence. I have a lot of questions about that and, and kind of everything else. I'm just gonna start asking really like stupid beginner's mind questions about what masculinity even means. People think of masculinity as innate. They don't think of it as something that we learn and we do because it's socialized. So you realize um, as a trans man there is a reaction to you as a man mm -hmm. um, that is uh, that is predicated on, on violence, mm -hmm. and you follow that curiosity. And boxing becomes the vehicle through which you analyze and interrogate what it is to be a man. Yeah. Um, so the book's all about this incredible journey mm -hmm. that ends in Madison Square Garden with mm -hmm. you in a boxing match. Mm -hmm. And even your trainer for much of that journey is not aware that you're a transgender man. I knew as soon as I decided that I wanted to explore violence that I was going to make a story out of it. A story about what is the relationship between masculinity and violence. People assume those things are interconnected. I'm experiencing it as if there's no, you know, as if these things are conflated. But I have a hunch that, uh, that they're not or it's not as easy as it looks in terms of this dynamic. So I knew going in that I was going to write a big story about this and I wanted to make sure that the conditions were correct for that story to feel um, genuine and authentic. And so I didn't want people to mediate their experience of me through me being trans. I didn't want that to be, I didn't want that to be a factor later where I thought, well, but maybe people saw me differently or thought of me differently. So part of that was just truly like a scientific thing. I also really wanted to, um, I don't know, I wanted to be safe, you know, and I wasn't sure what I was walking into. So, you know, that was a decision I made. I never made that decision before. I've never been someone who hasn't been really open about who I am, so that was interesting. Going into that experience, I had questions about what is a real man? I had questions about what does testosterone actually do, you know? I mean, I had questions about is it possible for me to be sexist as somebody who's had a different experience socially? Like, can I actually have come into this body and be a sexist person? The answer is yes, of course, we're all sexist, but uh, we're, we're, just as we're all racist. I mean, all these ways that we internalize this culture, if we don't understand what we're ingesting, we just become the thing. And that was really, truly the point. So I put myself in a precarious situation, yeah, but I think the more precarious situation would have been to just disappear into the night, you know, yeah. to have gone through this experience physically, medically, emotionally, psychologically, and socially of, of transitioning at 30 years old, which is when I started. So I had to really reinvent myself. I didn't want to do that at the cost of everything I learned before. I really wanted to bring knowledge with me. I didn't want to trade in one thing that wasn't working for a new thing that wasn't working, if that right. made sense. So yeah. I didn't want to just say, okay, well, this is what men do. And when I had asked the men in my life, it's not like my first thought was to try to 
box in Madison Square Garden, my first thought was to ask the people around me, you know, what do you do if a guy says something really sexist in front of you? What do you do if you're making a woman uncomfortable on the street? How do you handle it? How do you make sure you are not being a weaponized body yourself? And right. the guys around me didn't know. They just said, you know, you're not that kind of guy. Just don't worry about it. Or, you know, some guys are just like that, you know, like, what can you do? I felt like there had to be a more responsible and thoughtful way to like be the man that I was. And I thought the only way to do it was to really start from the beginning. So what was that first time in the ring like for you? What did you discover about yourself in the course of boxing? I mean, the very first day was really scary. Uh, and I felt like, what am I doing? You know, this is so stupid. Um, what I was doing was I signed up for a charity fight. Like that was sort of how I was able to, to have a reason to be doing any of this. And I remember like, you know, two months in, I had to do a sparring match with the guy I was going to eventually fight, uh, just to sort of make sure that we weren't so outmatched that it was going to be a disaster. Um, but the sparring was actually a disaster. It was really bad. Uh, <laughs> it was truly bad. Um, like the guy, you know, he had much more experience than me. He hit me so hard I fell over, which was technically a knockout. I mean, bad. But two things were really great. One was that I got up immediately, like very sort of intuitively. Like I just sort of was like, I don't know, like I'm in the middle of a match. I'm not gonna like lie on the floor. Like I had to keep going. And I guess in retrospect, that was like unusual. Uh, my coach was really excited about that. And the other thing that happened was like, all these guys were there, like the guys who were fighting in this charity match, but also all these other old timey dudes who were just hanging around. And it was kind of interesting cause like they didn't care what anybody was doing. But with me, they all kind of like gathered around the ring. Uh, and I thought at first it was because I was getting my ass kicked, you know, but it wasn't that like they were, they were like witnessing mm -hmm. something, you know, they could tell something wasn't going right, but they were there to like be supportive. Right. Which I realized after I got out of the ring and my coach was like, it's great. You did a great job. The fact that you got back up, like now we know what we're working with this guy, you know, he doesn't have anything like it's going to be fine. And all these other dudes, these old timey dudes came over and they were just like, you've got heart. You're great. Like, this is going to be awesome. Like they were just they saw something that I didn't even see. And that was like super cool, really healing. And also like, I think the way I had enough adrenaline to go through the rest of the process. After I had this experience, when I went back and I like, asked all the questions that came up, you know, during my training, I mean, every expert I spoke to talked about boyhood as a way to understand things that felt really, you know, hard and challenging about, about masculinity. The ways that we socialize boys create the men that we have around us. There's no distinction between the emotional world of boys and the emotional world of girls. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I learned in my, you know, my reporting, especially when it comes to intimacy and friendship. There's a definitive moment, and that's around 14 years old, where boys really um, push their, their best friends away. And that's around the time that other behaviors like, start to manifest uh, that, that I think we would call now toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. So how is that happening again and again, generation after generation? You know, It's not like there's a switch that turns on. It's how we're expecting boys to behave. So I think what I got wasn't necessarily empathy, you know, towards people who've been um, hurtful to, to me. Um, but what I understood was, if I wanted to understand how I was experiencing socialization at 30 in this way that was really throwing me off, like I had to also understand that that other men, cis men, experienced something very similar. But when they were so young that maybe they didn't have the wherewithal, the frontal lobes to actually yeah. process what was actually happening. Well, this yeah. is interesting because you were going through puberty in a sense mm -hmm. as an adult mm -hmm. man. So you were able to like look at it, turn it around, think about it yes. in a way that a 14 year old boy can't. No. Um, but what 14 year old boys are being taught basically is, is not to be too, ge too gay, too queer mm -hmm. and to, to distrust intimacy um, and, and what that might say about them. Yes. And not to question masculinity. I mean, masculinity is a thing that you're supposed to just know how to do. And if you ask a question about it, even if you want to turn it around in your head, people call you gay or feminine or whatever. Right. So it's a really brilliant scheme, you know, to uphold our whole culture. You talk about dating girls at high school who would say, oh, you're better than the real boys. It's humorous, but it's also a, it's a sort of profound point, really, about yeah. the, the way they're used to boys treating them or being with them. Yeah. Um, they would say you're like a boy, but better. If you think about it, it's like, regardless of what my you know, the nuance of my gender, I was socialized in, in a particular body. So I got all of the like, 
the benefits in some ways of female socialization, you know, like I, I didn't have to lose my sense of emotional intelligence, like at a young age. In fact, that was a benefit to me. And I didn't have to prove myself through dominance behaviors in that, in that same way that boys do. And so I think I had a, I had a more sensitive personality, which made me have a more competitive masculinity to the men around me. And that continued to be true into adulthood, you know, um, in some ways, now I really feel grateful, truly, that I didn't have a boyhood, even though that was painful at the time. I've been lucky to, to be just alive and myself in this moment where finally I think people are interested in paying attention to, to voices beyond the, the most mainstream dominant ones. Right. So what gives you hope? My own experience, honestly. Like, I feel like if someone ever told me as a kid that I was going to go all around the world and talk to people about masculinity and traveling and standing in front of people and saying like I'm this thing that maybe you feel scared of or angry about or whatever but like let's just have a real conversation and that people would react positively and give me awards and buy my book I mean that's that's pretty exciting